The podcast you are about to listen to is not a medical podcast, nor is it designed to diagnose a condition. While there are medical experts on this show, any questions regarding medical care or concern should be directed to a primary care physician. The team at Invax is dedicated to delivering new personalized immunotherapy approaches to improve outcomes for people living with glioblastoma and other solid tumors. Leveraging decades of validated research and technologies, Invax's unique platform is designed to capture a tumor's full antigen signature and use it to stimulate a patient's immune system against remaining tumor cells. Invax is currently recruiting for a randomized phase 2b clinical trial of IGV-001 in newly diagnosed glioblastoma patients. Learn more about this Phase 2b trial at imvax.com or clinicaltrials.gov. Imvax, advancing a new approach to personalized cancer immunotherapy. Welcome to Game on Glio a podcast that tells the stories of brain cancer warriors, clinicians, medical experts, and those in the grief and loss community. I'm your host, Shannon Traphagen. This season, you will hear unique brain cancer and grief and loss stories, as well as my own journey through grief and loss. If you enjoy our show, please consider writing a review. Also share us with a friend. You can follow us on Facebook at Game on Glio or Instagram and YouTube at Game on Glio Podcast. You can also visit and subscribe to our website at thegameongliopodcast.com for our blog, insights, clinical trials, and guest snapshots. Season 3 of the Game on Glio podcast is sponsored by GT MedTech and Gamma Tile Therapy. Learn more at gtmedtech.com. And by Imvax, personalized whole tumor-derived immunotherapies. Learn more at imvax.com. Novel technology, innovative clinical trials, inspired care. That's what you get with UB Neurosurgery. UB Neurosurgery, also known as UBNS, is ranked as one of the top-rated and busiest neurocath labs in the country. Our doctors are trained at top centers across the nation and work in a collaborative environment making your treatment and care our top priority. With over 50 human clinical trials, UBNS has its finger on the pulse of diagnosing and treating complex disorders of the brain and spine. Are you looking for outpatient services? UBNS has it. Atlas, UBNS's outpatient neurosurgical center, offers specialty services such as gamma knife, minimally invasive treatments, back pain prevention, as well as treating disorders of the brain and spine. UBNS, advancing the practice of neurosurgery through novel technology, innovative clinical trials, and inspired care. Learn more at ubns.com. It's easy to say you'll get through this. It's easy to say there is a light at the end of the corner. It's easy to say just climb that mountain a little bit further and you'll see the other side. Saying these things, having a mantra, pushing ourselves through the darkest, hardest times, it's easier to say than to do. Today's episode has it all. We talk about courage, strength, fear, some of our darkest, darkest moments, and most trying times. But we also have tips for the caregivers, inspiration on how to push through, how to navigate questions we ourselves have asked ourselves time and time again. It's an amazingly uplifting episode with Laura Dill today. It's an episode you won't want to miss. It's jam-packed and chock-full of great advice, a beautiful story, sage advice and wisdom, and a little bit of the ordinary, reminding all of us that we're in this together. We will sit down with our guest after a quick word from our sponsor. Imagine waking up from brain tumor removal surgery knowing that your radiation treatment is already underway. That's how gamma tile therapy works. At the end of brain tumor removal surgery, the neurosurgeon implants the tiny gamma tiles where the tumor is most likely to return. So instead of waiting to start daily standard radiation treatments that go for weeks, you get a head start against the tumor cells and get back to your life sooner. For operable brain tumors of all types, including glioblastomas, 
brain metastases, and meningiomas, gametal therapy is a one-time targeted radiation treatment with fewer side effects and far less chance of hair loss than external radiation. Gametile therapy is FDA-cleared radiation therapy for patients with newly diagnosed malignant brain tumors and recurrent brain tumors. Gametile therapy is tough on tumors and easier on patients and caregivers. Learn more at gametile.com. Joining us now, our guest today, is Laura Dill. She is the founder of Slay Society up in Ottawa, Canada, and the author of Daughter, Embracing the Difficult Journey of Caring for a Dying Parent. She is a wife and a mother of three. And she joins us today to talk about her journey being in the glioblastoma community. Laura, thank you so much for being with us today. Shannon, thank you so much for having me here today. And every time I hear an intro like that, it still feels like this can't actually be my life. (laughs) Oh, you are preaching to the choir. It's kind of hard to imagine. Glioblastoma is not an easy word that rolls off the tongue, is it? No, no, for so many, so many reasons. It doesn't deserve that many letters or syllables. No. Nor does it deserve an all caps abbreviation, but it certainly isn't fun to say at all. So many know your story, but there are so many more that don't. Your story has got an incredible, incredible impact when it comes to this community. Let's dive back into 2019, which ironically was the year that my husband was diagnosed. For some reason, every time I talk to somebody within the brain cancer community, there's all of these numbers and dates that all seem to coincide. And I I, I don't know the meaning behind that yet, but... You were thrust into the world of brain cancer because of your parents' diagnosis. And I'm going to, to emphasize that. Parents, plural. Both parents. Yeah. Tell us what happened. Tell us a little bit about that journey. Anybody who's delivered a diagnosis of glioblastoma is certainly thrust into the world of brain cancer and completely unprepared, I'm assuming. Um, and I assume that was the case for you and the experience for you as well. We were thrust into that world in September or August of 2019. And when my dad was diagnosed, and it absolutely took us by storm, we had no thought in our mind that a brain tumor, let alone glioblastoma, but that even a brain tumor could be something we would ever have had to face. Mm -hmm. We immediately, my my dad went into, he was 63, and he immediately said to us, guys, we're not going to cry yeah, not to mean we're not allowed to cry, but he said, nope, we're not going to cry right now in this moment. This was in the hospital room. The doctor had just come in and confirmed cancer of the brain, to use his words exactly. Mm. He had not said glioblastoma, but he had said cancer of the brain. Okay. And we were so dumbfounded. And we, we left the room crying. And I came back in a few minutes later. And my dad said, no, Laura, that's not how we're going to do this. We are just going to slay one dragon at a time. Mm. And if they tell me tomorrow I need surgery, that's the dragon we slay. And if they tell me the next day I'm going to start radiation, that's the dragon we slay. And we went about, you know, about our days and our lives in the hospital, being there every day by his side, going through surgery, going through the endless list of medications, having him sent home. I mean, you've done this. It's like you're being sent home with a new baby. Mm -hmm. It's terrifying. And you think, how how am I supposed to do this? Aren't these doctors coming home with me? How do I keep this teeny tiny thing alive? Mm -hmm. I'm not prepared. I'm not cut out. And that's how I felt. You know, that's how we all felt taking my dad home from the hospital. But four days after my dad came home from the hospital, which was exactly 14 days after his diagnosis, it was my birthday and I was eating ice cream cake with my dad. And my mom dropped of a seizure, hit the kitchen floor and was rushed to emerge was put in the same hospital as my dad, same emergency area as my dad, brought up to the same neurosurgery ward as my dad, and was diagnosed with two brain tumors, both being glioblastoma. Wow. Yeah. Two weeks. Two weeks to the day on my birthday. My, You know, there's that movie, I think it's a movie called To Jillian on Her 37th Birthday. Oh, yeah. And I almost titled my book To Laura on Her 37th Birthday, <laughs> and my mom was diagnosed with glioblastoma two weeks after my father was. So here you were, you had both parents who, and I'm, I'm going to stress this because we can't stress this enough. They were your parents. Mm -hmm. So there's no blood relation between the two of them. (laughs) No, you know, there's no genetic relation between the two of them. And yet they were both diagnosed. 
Yeah. Oddly enough, that's the first question I get. You know, people spin back to, do you think it's environmental? But I definitely always get a um, question of, is it hereditary? And I sure mm-hmm. hope that my parents weren't related in, in some way. <laughs> no, God. <laughs> I, I we don't even want to go down that road. <laughs> I don't think we need to worry about it, luckily. So both your parents were diagnosed. Mm-hmm. Now you're caring for both parents. What did the doctors have to say? Let's start with that. I mean, having both parents diagnosed, did they have any thoughts as to, because it's, it's a pretty incredible circumstance to have happened. And I've spoken to many, many doctors who have said, that it not only is this a rare cancer to begin with, but to have something like this hit a family, like a direct family, more than once in such a short period of time is not only remarkable, but it's like a 0.5% chance. What were the doctors saying to you when all of this was going on with both your mom and your dad? Well, it was crazy that day that my mom was diagnosed, walking back into that same hospital and down those same hallways that we left four days prior. And every doctor and nurse just stared at me with this look of fear in their eyes. And they've gotten to know my dad quite well over the 10 days he was there. And they all said, oh my gosh, Laura, what happened? Why is he back? What, what happened with your dad? And to have to say, like to look at these people and it was such an out of body experience to look at them and say, no, it's my mom. It's my mom now. <laughs> She's here. She has a brain tumor. It was so surreal. And I you know, the the biggest memory for me was just jaws dropping. Everybody's jaw dropped and everybody shook their head and nobody really had words. Even the doctors, even the neurosurgeons, nobody knew what to make of that. And to this day, nobody still knows what to make of that. Unfortunately, I did get answers like, you're never going to pin this. You're never going to figure this out. And that was very discouraging to hear that from the medical world, because I assumed this is such an anomaly that we're going to crack this now. Like, let's go. We have this insane coincidence, if it can be called that, and I don't think it is. Somebody has to now take notice and say, okay, no, these don't, these sort of things don't, quote, just happen like this. These, because that's often the case, right? You say, well, what did I do to get glioblastoma? And the doctors say, well, these things just happen. You didn't do anything wrong. These things just happen. And I don't think anyone's done anything wrong. Anybody who has glioblastoma has certainly not brought that on themselves. But in my opinion, there has to be some kind of an environmental factor that plays into triggering on those genes, Mm -hmm. right? Those cells, that activity in those tumors. And so we have, my father went back to the house that we built. Now, the caveat here is my parents were married for 20 years, and then they were actually divorced for 20 years. They both were remarried to other people. They got along famously for the sake of my three children and myself and my brother. And we were very, very blessed for that. But my dad went back to the house that we last lived in. And we built that house out in the country, just outside of Ottawa. Mm -hmm. And the lady living in our home actually is living with a brain tumor. And the neighbor had passed away of a glioblastoma. Oh, wow. Yeah. So we obviously very much believe that there is an environmental link and there is research being done in that area currently. Okay. So I'm not sure else I'll ever see a cause found, but I will never not spend a day of my life left here not trying to find a cause for everybody ahead of me. Right. Well, when you're in a circumstance like this, how can you not? Mm -hmm. And there have been cases even here in the U.S. that can show an environmental link. It's a small percentage, but there are cases that have been shown and some are fairly high profile cases right now Mm -hmm. that are being looked into. So whether or not that is a component or not waits to be seen, but it's a question that needs to be asked. Absolutely. So with both of your parents, um, sadly, each of them has passed away. Yeah. We can use the word past, but I've moved into using the word they've died. Um, They have died. I've. Yeah. My husband died, you know, anytime I've said passed away, it just sounds like they've gone to this lovely little place. <laughs> it's like, no, you know, they're just, they're no longer with us. Yeah. What type of treatments did they have access to? Did they do any clinical trials and how long did each of them have before they died? Well, in Canada, our standard of care looks very, you know, very, very much like it does in the U.S. And so it's the standard six weeks of radiation, five days a week, and then a month break 
and then six months, so sort of those six rounds of five days on of um, chemotherapy and 23 days off. And so that was what they were, you know, presented with, and they both were happy to follow suit. And there was a clinical trial happening here in Ottawa at the time, and they both agreed they were just incredibly selfless people. And they both agreed to do this clinical trial. But the way that the trial was set up was there was no placebo group. Mm. So there was an A group and a B group, and you were either going to get the chemo or you were not going to get the chemo. But there was no placebo chemo pill or chemo you know, infusion. Okay. And so it was by random selection, and it just happened, as unethical as it felt, that one of my parents would get the chemo and the other one would be in the other group and not receive this extra chemo. Oh, wow. And that was really hard because it felt like I was, and I literally was pinning one parent against the other. I was actually using them as a comparison to each other. And I was already doing that. And so was everybody else in our world saying, well, how come your dad threw up after his first day of chemo, but your Mm -hmm. mom didn't? Maybe it's because she's keto. Maybe it's because of this. Maybe it's because of that. So we were constantly being inundated with this comparison game. Mm -hmm. And then there's, because my parents were divorced, I had taken my mom to live with me and my dad was being cared for wonderfully by his wife. And there was always a battle, a constant, constant battle in my heart over which one I was picking. Like if I can quote picking, Mm -hmm. because I would certainly never pick one parent over the other. But every time I had to do something with my mom, couldn't go to my dad's appointment, I'd feel like I was picking her over him. You know, and every time my mom would, you know, go home on a weekend, she lived out of town and that's why she had stayed in the city with me while she was going through treatment. But on the weekend, she'd head back out of town to stay with her husband. I would feel like I was picking him over her and it was awful. So then to have this clinical trial land in the way that it did with them both in separate groups, it felt so unethical. Oh my God. To watch how one would react, you know, Mm -hmm. how one would there with this extra treatment and the other one just wouldn't get the extra treatment. So that was really hard. We did not have Optune in Canada or anything like that at that time. So it really was just standard of care. And then this one clinical trial that was available to us. Did the clinical trial help? It's really hard to say because Mm. he did do better in general, in a very general sense. My dad did quite a bit better than my mom. Now, my mom had two tumors, both removed two days apart. Mm -hmm. Radiation, the area of my mom's brain that was radiated was substantial because they were radiating around, like almost putting these two tumors together and radiating the whole circumference around the two voids. Right. So a lot more of her brain was radiated and she just went downhill very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Whereas my dad didn't. Is that because of a, you know, not having access to that trial? Did he do better because of that trial? I don't know. And I think that's what's so tricky about glioblastoma is that we just don't know enough. Right. You know, as much as that trial might have felt like it took time, it was so necessary. And I don't think my dad would have done it any differently. And he knew this may not help me, mm-hmm. but if it doesn't help me, I'll help them know that it's not helpful <laughs> and they will stop wasting their time and move on to the next thing. And that's going to help people down the road. Right. And that's the, I mean, that's the important thing with clinical trials is that you really need in order for us to find answers, in order for us to figure out what works and what doesn't. Unfortunately, this is the step that, that we need. This is what we need to do in order to figure that out. Mm -hmm. But it's amazing the split between your mom and dad. I mean, as a caregiver, that's an immense amount of pressure that takes such a heavy toll, especially when you're trying to balance. You're the daughter of yeah. your mom and your dad, and you love them both. Emotionally, that takes a heavy, heavy toll. And there's a, a lot of balance that goes along with that. Yeah. And I cannot imagine that that was easy. You know, so what did you do to, to keep yourself balanced and to not lean into this constant comparison or guilt that you were feeling? Um, How did you keep yourself above water? You know, it's it's so interesting because I literally, literally wrote the book about this, Shannon, and yet I don't even think (laughs) I can answer the question. Like, I, I don't even know. You know, I think you're just in it and you're just going through the motions every day and I will say one of the things I did is right in the beginning, 
when it was actually only my dad for that glorious 14 days when I only had one parent diagnosed, I told my husband, I'm going to stop working. I'm going to actually just work part time. I owned three businesses, my own Mm -hmm. three small businesses. And um, Mm -hmm. I said, "I, I have to put all these on hold. And I'll just work one of them part time and I'll shelf the other two because I might only have a year. You asked earlier how much time they had and I hadn't answered that. But my dad passed away after only seven months and my mom after 13 months. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, if I only have a year, I'm going to squeeze out every possible second of that year. So my husband's a financial planner. And it was very stressful for him to think, oh, we're going to have no income from you for the next while. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Three kids, and we can't can't afford to live that way. But there was no other option in my mind. I just had to be with my dad as much as I could. And so I think, you know, and then my mom being diagnosed two weeks later, I said, no, all my businesses are getting now put on hold. Like I'm not doing any, not even Mm part-time. And I think for me, that was the saving grace. I think I was able to Oh, walk out of that journey, I guess, with no regrets. I have to say, I don't have a single regret. I talked to a friend early on in their diagnoses, I think plural of diagnosis mm-hmm. is diagnoses. Who even knew you'd have to say that ever in your life? But, and I said, How do you do this? She had lost her, her mother to cancer years before. I said, How did you do this, Kyla? And she said, Take all the pictures and say all the things. And I really took that to heart. To the mm-hmm. point where I, think I annoyed a lot of my family having my phone in their face. <laughs> but my gosh, I'm so grateful I did. I got to take all the pictures and I got to say all the things, the hard things, the uncomfortable things, the inappropriate things, all of the things. And if I hadn't stopped my work, and if I hadn't given myself that year to just literally be present every day with them, mm-hmm. I wouldn't have been able to balance that with being a mom, with being a wife, with you know, still trying to manage being a business owner here and there as best I could with the financial stress. There's no way I could have managed any of that or balanced any of that if I hadn't just had the time to stay, stay there beside them. And I feel like I need to say this. We couldn't afford to do that. Mm -hmm. However, I I think this might come up after, but I was just very well supported by the community, Mm -hmm. which is why I started my, my fundraiser, which we'll get to, but that help from the community and my ability to learn. And I really had to learn because it was very hard at first, learn to accept help and to say yes to anybody who came to my door and said, give me your laundry. I'm going to take it home and wash it and return it to you tomorrow full dead. Mm-hmm. First, I was like, no, that's not <laughs> happening. They just sort of succumbed to all of these offers. Mm-hmm. And I started to really get comfortable saying, yep, here's my laundry. Yep, sure. You can b- buy us dinner tonight. Yep. Send the gift card to this address. And there is no way I would have survived without having had all of that help. We are going to touch on this a little bit more and part of that community support, but it's so important to focus and to kind of zero in on that because it is really crucial and it is key. And I think when, especially when you are the primary caregiver, but you're also trying to balance these other aspects of life, it is so hard to figure out where to put the energy and where not to. And you have a husband and you have three kids. And you were trying to balance all of this. And I can't even imagine stepping into your shoes in that situation. And I was overwhelmed. I was overloaded. I can't even imagine having the other pieces of it when you're in it day to day. And I was the same as you. I had a hard time asking for help. I didn't even know where to ask for help exactly because I was still balancing a job. Unfortunately, I I had to kind of stay with the work that I was doing. I was able to take a little time here and there but I couldn't completely check out of the work that I was doing at the time while he was in treatment. Mm -hmm. But my whole focus became, how do we get him further? How do we get him to three years, to five years? That was kind of the focus and the goal. And I was, I was inundated. I was, and we didn't have family that lived right in the area. They came out as much as possible. You know, we had friends that constantly checked in. People did, you know, like a meal plan, a meal train, but it took, I honestly don't, I don't think I asked for a ton of help until after he died. You know, when you talk about you have no regrets, there are some times where there were things that I wish he and I said before things declined because the decline happened very rapidly. It was unexpected. Right. So he was stable for six months, doing really, really well. And then all of a sudden just went down very quickly. And we had no clue what was going on because he had just had an MRI that showed he was good. 
we didn't know it got into his cerebral spinal fluid. So like your mom, he only had about 14 months, which is not the standard. That's not the norm. So it is crucial to understand limitations, to understand those moments and those points and to be able to say, it's not a sign of weakness to say, yes, we'll accept this. Yes. I honestly think and learned that it's a sign of strength, Mm -hmm. you know, to be able to admit to yourself and or publicly, I just need some help. I think that's actually a sign of strength. I think we all put up this and this has been ingrained into us by society that we're, we're supposed to be able to handle all these things on our own, but that's not how it was way back in the day. That's saying that it takes a village to raise a child. When trauma hits, I think you can just go ahead and treat yourself like a child. <laughs> and assume that you need a village. My mom, when she was living here, <clears throat> right after her surgery, she was here recovering. And she said, Laura, I want to, I want to write a Facebook post. And, you know, I wasn't sure <laughs> if that was partly some of the brain damage talking, because she's never written a Facebook post in her life. But she has an account that she didn't know how to use. And I said, okay, mom, I'm going to, I'll take your phone. You tell me what you want to say and I'll, I'll type it in and, you know, we'll post this for you. And it was this whole thing about how, how she was thanking all these individual people for being there over the past week for her Mm. and how God had surrounded her with this army of angels. It, It stuck with me, this army of angels concept. And a few weeks later, my children were starting school or it might've been days later. And I had put a post out on social media saying, Hey, I failed as a parent. (laughs) Does anybody know what the kids need for school, for back to school supplies? Mm. School board sends out a list, right? For their age group, for their grades. And I said, I haven't gotten anything (laughs) for my children. I don't know what they need. Does anyone have the list? I just need the list. Send it to me and I will at some point get to a store. And my cousin's wife messaged me and said, I'm going to go and, you know, and grab some stuff for you. And my thought was, oh, that's what a huge favor. Thank you. And then I will send you an e-transfer. And she got here with these three bags, one for each of my children. And they were loaded with a backpack, a lunch bag, pencils, glue, scissors, everything they needed. And I said, send me your email address. And she said, no, I'm not taking any money for that. I remember just feeling so, I started to cry. And I said, I can't let you pay for my kids back to school stuff. It's enough that you went and got the supplies for me and saved me that hour or two hours. And she said, Laura, stop. You have an entire army of people wanting to help you let them. There's that word. (laughs) Yeah. And it was so huge to me that the way she said, let them. And it made me realize people want to help. Mm -hmm. I want to help. And so my best friend's husband is going in for an Achilles tendon surgery right now as we speak. And I'm like, what can I do? Can I bring you dinner? Can I pick up your kids? (laughs) I do this. Your husband's not going to be able to walk for a while. I mean, we desperately want to help each other. Mm -hmm. And then we're getting in our own way as these victims saying, no, no, I got it. It's okay. I got it. I can do it on my own. No, we can't. No, we freaking can't. There's no way we can do it on our own. So we have to start allowing other people to step in and help us when we need it because we know we would turn around and do the same. And we'd be so grateful to be able to offer that to somebody else. And part of this help that you received, and this is what I want to touch on, this kind of ties into what we're talking about right now. Part of this community, this army of support that you had was through hockey. Yeah. So, and you know, we are a very big hockey community out here as well. Yes. And so let's talk about that because hockey is a very important part of your life and it has been for a long time. So how did your hockey community really step up to help you out during this huge time and this transition in your life? Yeah, I am just, I'm so blessed, honestly. I, I started playing hockey when I was nine and you know, being in Canada, that <laughs> pretty fitting, but, <laughs> and obviously where you are too, it's pretty fitting, but it's serendipitous because here is a sport that has continuously in my lifetime and I'm, I'm 40, it has continuously showed up for me and supported me and through very tough and tumultuous times in, in high school and through my parents' divorce and through the loss of friends, I have always had hockey to fall back on and always been very aware and grateful that I never got into anything else like drugs or alcohol or any other coping because I had soccer and hockey and, you know, these I'm very athletic and I've always felt so grateful for that. And so then to be 30, 37 and, you know, have this happen to my family, even as an adult with a bunch of grown women, my team stepped up and threw together 
and I shouldn't say throw together because it sure wasn't a last minute impulsive thing. They organized a fundraiser for my family that fall and they managed to raise about $8,000 for, you know, and that doesn't sound like a lot of money, but, and really in the end, it's not, I mean, you guys know the cost of Mm -hmm. the cost that accumulate with a glioblastoma diagnosis is endless. But what it did for me, they gave that to me in the fall of 2019 was allowed me to actually do the thing I just talked about, which was stop working and stay home. And we stretched, thank goodness, my husband is a financial planner because he stretched that $8,000 over the entire winter Wow! and spring. Mm -hmm. And we were able to get by without accumulating any debt at all. Them doing that for me, I mean, they, they truly, that team of women is truly who gave me that time back. And it's in the end, it's actually why I started the Slay Society. Mm -hmm. Not everybody gets that time. And I wanted to be able to give, what they gave me was something I'll never be able to Gosh, I don't even know the <laughs> words. I could never thank them enough, obviously, and that sounds cliche, but I couldn't have asked for more. I had the time to not work and to sit in the hospital every day and read books to my mom or play music with my dad or walk him around the hallway. Precious, precious time. So precious. And they helped give that to you. They absolutely gave that to me. It's so important to have communities like that and to have supports around you. Because I don't think most people do understand the financial burden that really does come down to the immediate family that's impacted. And when the caregiver has all of a sudden, and it's not even just when they're sick. No. When they pass, when they die. And this is something that we haven't talked about a lot. And I do want to talk about it more. Funeral costs, expenses that build up after they die. Is it extraordinary. I was dumbfounded that Mike's <laughs> funeral cost almost as much as our wedding. Yeah. It's- I was dumbfounded. <laughs> it was staggering. It was staggering. Yeah. Um, and I paid for it. And those kind of burdens are immense, especially when you're also in the throes of grief and trauma and trying to get your footing. And so to have this community rally around you, a community you're still heavily a part of. I mean, you. St- I'm, I'm assuming you still play, correct? I still play. I mean, two leagues. And one of them, we've actually renamed our team Slay. So we actually have oh, that's awesome. called Slay. Yeah. With our that is self. terrific. <laughs> it's, really, it's really, really great. Let's dive into that a little bit because we're talking about Slay, the hockey team. We're talking about the Slay Society that we've mentioned a few times now in our conversation. You started the Slay Society when your parents, um, after they were diagnosed, after they passed away, they died. So tell us a little bit about the Slay Society. When did you actually formalize it? And what does the Slay Society do? What is the Slay Society all about? Well, I started the Slay Society in 2020 and it was February of 2020. My parents were actually both still here at that time. But in February, I thought I really want to give some money back to other people who aren't getting the same. I was really public about our story on social media. I mean, that's how you and I connected. Mm hmm. And I didn't have any fear or, you know, inhibitions doing that. And, and I've always been a very public, open person. Because I was so public our, and because our story is so bizarre, it just gained a lot of attention. And so I did get a lot of that mm-hmm. support from community. And I did learn how to accept that help that we talked about. And so I did have gift cards and food and gosh, I can't even name the amount of things that came to my door on a daily basis. They were rolling in. The help was rolling in. And somebody one day made a comment to me that, oh, that must be nice. No one's giving me $100 gift cards for gas. Mm -hmm. And I thought, but who knows that you're struggling? Nobody knows you're struggling. You're not telling anyone. And and this is okay. This is for each person to manage in their own way that is comfortable for them. But if those people aren't comfortable going out in the public and saying, I'm really struggling and can someone help me with my kid's school pickup or a mm-hmm. dinner for tomorrow? And one day I went online and I said, oh, crap, it's my, my husband's birthday today and I forgot to do anything. <laughs> so I literally put up Dairy Queen cake and drop it off at my door and it was there within 20 minutes. Oh. And I would put these things on social media and I would, I would pay back. And, I, you know, but if you don't do that, who's going to know that you're struggling? And so who's helping those people? And so I decided, you know, well, I could do this small cookie fundraiser for Valentine's Day. I had a friend that baked sugar cookies. And I said, would you make a bunch? And maybe we raise like $50 and I could give someone else $50. Again, as a human being, I just want to help 
anybody and everybody who's struggling. Yeah. Right. We all want to do that. Most of us anyway. I was going to say, yeah, most of us, some people just, it's not their, it's not their thing. No, that's true. And I didn't have $50 in my pocket to turn around and give somebody else, mm-hmm. but I was resourceful and I was very, very social <laughs> um, and I'm incredibly creative. So I could get somebody else to make cookies and then I could just sell them. So we raised about $250 with this cookie fundraiser. Wow. And that felt so good. And I thought, well, maybe I could do like an online auction. Now we're into March. COVID has hit. My dad is declining. He's in the hospital. We're isolated from him. He's undergone surgery number four. Mm -hmm. He ended up with a total of six brain surgeries. So he's into surgery number four. My mom's in a separate hospital on the other side of the city. I can still be with her every single day as her primary caregiver Mm -hmm. during COVID. It was palliative. Nobody could be with my dad. So we were in, like we were right in the thick of it. And everyone was saying to me, it's the end of March of 2020. You're going to do an online fundraiser. And they would say, Laura, businesses are closing their doors. You can't go and ask people for donations of products or services when people are literally shutting down their businesses right now. Right. And I said, well, watch me. <laughs> if they say no, they say no. Exactly. But if I can get five prizes, I'll still do an auction for fun. Maybe I'll raise a hundred dollars. So I went ahead, I pushed through, I, I did it. I asked four times as many businesses as I probably would have in a non-pandemic. And we raised $4,000 with that auction. Wow. And we gave that to one girl who was traveling across the country. She lived in Canada on the West Coast. Her dad was in Ottawa here. And this young girl, a young mom of two, same age as me, only child, was flying all the way from the West Coast into Ottawa once a month for a week at a time to take care of her dad. She was all her dad had. And so we gave her that $4,000 and covered many, many flights until he died. And it was just the feeling of being able to do that for another human being was something I can't describe. And it just became this addiction of, I just need to help as many people as I can who are walking this path that I walked and need to have the time that I got to have. Mm -hmm. Even though it was short, I got to have memories and and quality and profound moments in that time. And other people deserve that too. It's empowering. It's very empowering. It's empowering to be able to not only pay it forward, but to be able to say, here's what we want to do to help you. Mm -hmm. We want to make a difference, even if it's moving the needle just a tiny, tiny bit. If you can help one person and maybe that one person turns around and they help somebody else down the road because of the impact that it had on them, it does create this domino effect. Absolutely. It's so crucial and it is so powerful to have those kind of moments. And we need this kind of support and this kind of help in the brain cancer community because without it, we won't get anywhere. We won't go any further. And we do need to change the game and change the story. You know, it's part of why the podcast is called what it is. (laughs) It's game on. You know, we need to tackle this. Giving that kind of support to that young girl, I guarantee, has impacted her for the rest of her life. And she will then carry that forward, as will everybody else that you have helped along the way, even if it's a gas card to get back and forth to the hospital or to help them pay for the parking garage expenses that accumulate every time you're coming in and out of the parking garage at the hospital. You know, those kind of things, you know, during the pandemic. We were in the same position you were in as far as doing treatments in the midst of a global shutdown Mm -hmm. economically. And for us, what became a challenge is food. Can I get to the store every day? Well, if I can, or if I don't want to expose my husband Mm -hmm. who was in the house, now I have to pay for a service to deliver the food. And that is expensive. Absolutely. Or we're signing up for HelloFresh, but it becomes extremely expensive. Yeah. But you're trying to safeguard. Yeah. And so you're not thinking about those kind of things until after the fact. So when somebody reaches out and just says, we're delivering the groceries this week, or we're going to do this, or we're going to do that, it does. It makes a huge impact. Yeah. I think it's so powerful that the Slay Society, every little bit helps. It doesn't have to be hundreds of thousands of dollars. Every little bit makes such a difference to the people that it touches. I know I've said this so many times, but there were days I would come home and, you know, there was a specific day I came home and there was a little gift bag on my front door and it was a $500 
gift card for Esso gas station, one of our big Canadian gas stations up here. Mm -hmm. And I dropped to my knees and cried. And days later, I came home and there was another little gift bag hanging on my front door. And it was a $5 gift card for Tim Hortons. And I dropped to my knees and cried. (laughs) It didn't matter what the amount was. I mean, in, you know, of course, in some ways it did, but it didn't matter spiritually, energetically, emotionally. It didn't matter what the amount was. It mattered that any human being on this planet thought of me, thought of my family, thought of my parents, and just wanted to make a difference and brighten my day in some way. Mm-hmm. That's what people need. They just need to know, you know, do, have you ever had that pay it forward thing happen at the at the coffee shop drive through where someone buys your coffee? Have you ever had that? I haven't had that happened to me, but I have done that for somebody else where I've gone through the drive through and I've said the car behind me, I'm going to take care of them. And I've driven off. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I have done it about a dozen times to my husband's complete mortification. Again, being a financial <laughs> guy, he's like, stop doing that, Laura. We can't afford to buy everybody else's coffee. I'm like, no, no, no. It'll come back to us. I swear. Uh, but it's only ever happened to me once. But Shannon, I <laughs> picked that coffee up from that girl's hand at the window I drove into a parking spot and sobbed my face. (laughs) Finally, finally, it's come for me. And the feeling, oh my God, the day that I had, and this was after my parents had died, but just the day I had that followed that coffee gift, Mm -hmm. (laughs) the elation I walked through that day with, I don't even know. I will tell you, it was the sunniest, brightest day in the world. It could have been pouring rain on my head. It just felt so light. I was so energetic. Like for someone to just give me that gift of having a day like that over one coffee, I mean, that's the kind of impact that we have as people helping other people. It's immense. That human kindness. Yeah. As you're talking about this, it actually reminds me of, um, and it wasn't somebody paying it forward to me. It was just, the, it was the simple act of kindness. Yeah. That carried me through. There was a day that I was just randomly walking through the village where I live. I was, it was going into a store. It was after Mike had died Mm -hmm. and I was not in a good space at all. This person, this random person, I have no idea who they are to this day. (laughs) They walked up to me. They know nothing about me. I was just starting the podcast. So my story wasn't completely out there yet. Yeah. And they grabbed my arm as they walked by and they just said, your day is going to be extremely blessed and you will have a really good day. Hold on to your strength. That's all they did. Aww. They smiled at me and then they kept walking. Wow. I stood there for a minute. Like I was not able to process what had just happened. Yeah. And when I got home, I felt like that was the universe or God, or it was somebody's way of just saying, hang in there, girl, hang in there. It might've been Mike. My- yep. <laughs> so even those kind of, it, just the simple act of kindness mm-hmm. and of empathy and of caring it really truly does lift people up and it carries us and it just gives us so much strength in a way that people I don't think understand. I don't think they realize how valuable that truly is. Well, and it, you know, we mix up, I think sometimes we mix up pay it forward in, in we have this kind of notion that it's supposed to be about money. Paying it forward means you have yes. to buy a coffee <laughs> for the person behind you or, you know, whatever. But no, paying it forward is exactly that, right? It can be done yeah. through these acts of kindness. I, I actually was doing this big event this, you know, over the past four, four to six days, which you you know all about. And you had <laughs> we had this unfortunate theft from our charity booth at the event, and Shannon had turned onto social media and asked for help, <laughs> able to rally around us. And we did. I will happily say we did make that money back tenfold. Yeah. 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 It was incredible. Um, and so thank you for that. So it doesn't take money. It just takes conscious effort and kindness and empathy. And empathy. It's such a big deal. When we're walking through the journeys that we walk through, those small little things mean so much. Yeah. Looking back at, as we're talking about kind of all of this and what you've done with the Slay Society with where you guys are now and the support that you offer up in Canada, the support that you received. When you look back at your journey, and we're going to bring in another element of this in a second, Mm -hmm. but when you look back at your life before GBM and your life post GBM and where you are now, how would you say that you've grown? Can you say that you've taken something positive from the journey that you've walked? 
I think I, and I, I hope that for everybody, I hope the reality is anyone who's gone through this would be hard pressed to not have positive takeaways. And that sounds really ironic. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, unfortunately, there will be people listening to this who are just sitting in the heaviest, darkest time of their life thinking, no way, there's no way, Laura, you have your head in the clouds. And believe me, I was there. There was definitely moments, um, moments, days, weeks, months. Oh, there are dark days. Dark. There are very dark days. I will go right into it. Days of, uh, I don't want to live anymore. If my parents die, maybe I should just die. And then after they did die, you know, I can't do this. I'm so screwed up. I'm screwing up my kids. I mean, there was awfully dark days, especially in year two of the pandemic, mm-hmm. especially in the winter. I have been through all those emotions, 8.30 in the morning, sobbing over the edge of a bathtub, barely breathing. And we're not saying that this, this is why we're saying this, because it's the hope within this. We both understand yeah. those dark moments. And you just, I mean... I, I'm right there with you. I, I, there are many, many nights that I just sat up in the corner of a bedroom, huddled in a ball, thinking, "What did I do to deserve this? What did he do? What well, I don't, yeah, know. like I, yeah. I, dark, very, very, very dark moments. Yeah. Why him? And those are there, but where we are right now, and what we want to show everybody is that no matter how dark things get, there is always hope and strength. And that is why I asked this question. And it's not having our head in the clouds. Mm -hmm. It's showing everybody that if we can do this, you can too. And I think it's so important too to acknowledge that anybody who is having those thoughts, that they're very normal. It's very normal. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you need help with those thoughts, reach out. Reach out to me. Reach out to Shannon. Reach out to a licensed therapist. But they're so, so, so normal. But then yes, the joy can exist and it can coexist. You can literally feel one way one second in this tumultuous, crazy journey. And then you can feel completely the opposite one second later. And you'll wonder if you've got mental health issues. And I mean, I certainly, (laughs) absolutely something's going on, but this is not to say that the dark days don't still come. I mean, don't, don't believe for a second that Shannon doesn't still cry. Mm -hmm. Don't believe for a second that I don't still sink down against my kitchen cupboards every now and then and just break down. But what has changed in me most is the value of time and not the value of time as in, you know, it's funny when my parents were diagnosed, I don't know why, maybe it was a a self-protection thing. My mind accepted right away that they would probably be gone in a year. And I actually didn't do that battle of how do I get them to two years or three years or four years. I just did. I don't know why, but my mind went to, well, that's out of my control. Mm Mm-hmm how do I make this year matter? And funny, because you think, how do you make it matter? You, we'll do that one big trip. We'll do the big blowout party. We'll do all the mm-hmm. things on the bucket list we never got to do. No, it was, I'm going to read him The Hobbit every night when he's sleeping. I oh, love that story. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> he read it to me as a kid. Or I'm going to sit with my mom and play that song and just stare at her face for as long as I can. Mm -hmm. I mean, those were the things that mattered when she would look at me when she was no longer able to really talk. And she'd look at me in these rare moments where she actually would find me, like her eyes would actually find mine and Mm -hmm. she wouldn't just look past me or through me, but she'd literally see me for a split second and then like half smile. Mm -hmm. And I would feel like she's here. She's right there. She's right there. And I would try to freeze frame those moments in my in my mind. So the value of finding quality in your time has really changed for me. Quality over quantity, which is just also so cliche, but it's so true. Mm -hmm. And then I didn't realize what an absolute whiny child I was before (laughs) (laughs) we were diagnosed. And you know, I'm not a spoiled kid. I never was a spoiled kid. I I didn't grow up that way. My parents obviously raised us to be pretty level-headed we were wealthy in that we had a home that we owned and a vehicle that we owned and, and all that stuff. We weren't wealthy by way of like, we didn't do trips every year. Mm -hmm. We didn't have all these fancy things, but we certainly had everything that we needed. But I just, I don't know, you look back and now and you think I complained about stuff like that. Mm -hmm. All the things I complained about that I now realize what a waste, what a waste of energy, what a waste of time, what a waste of my own resources. And the other thing I think I've stopped doing which is a positive is I've stopped doubting myself so much because what does it matter in the end? Interesting. Just do the things you want to do in your life. And I don't mean go, you know, go max out your credit card and go on that trip, but do that too. If that's what, mm-hmm. that's what you need to do. 
but go after the things you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Stop doubting yourself because at the end of the day, it's not going to matter. Your life is your life. Your journey has to look how you want it to look. And all the people that you think now are judging you, they're not going to matter down the road. Yeah. They don't even matter now, to be honest, if they're judging you. That's so powerful what you're saying right now and, and the way that you're looking at it. And I hope that people can carry a piece of that away because it is so vital to have mm-hmm. some type of tools to be able to look to. You find strength in unusual places at times. And so I think it's so valuable that you've learned to take some of these things away that you can look back at the pre and the post and say, this is what's changed for me. And this is how I've grown through these circumstances. And I think that's what life has always been about. And I think at times when you're not hit with tragedy or trauma, you don't understand the value of the precious aspect of what life is. When these things do happen, it really does pull you into a place of life is so much more precious than we realize. It's not to be taken for granted. Mm -hmm. And it's learning to be content. Yes. You know, for me, the value of being content with where I was or where I am and what I have, that was something that I took away from the journey that we were on. And that was a hard lesson to get to. (laughs) It is a hard, it's a hard lesson to get to. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, I, I want to throw this in too, because there's always, you know, the reality is I'm making it sound like there's this beautiful lesson that's come out of this. And there is, however, I'm still mad as hell. I don't want anyone, you know, I would, I would trade it all back and I'd go back to being that whiny child if I could have both my parents back on this earth. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm mad that my parents were taken. That still exists in me. And I think the other side of the coin is that those can coexist, like we talked about before, with the dark moments and the joy. And I'm mad that they are not here. I'm mad that something came along that made no sense. But you talked about calling this podcast Game On Cleo Mm -hmm. as an athlete, uh, the way I look at it, and I love the name of the podcast for this reason, (laughs) is, and we'll use hockey in particular, but as a hockey player, there's always, when there's a fight, there's an instigator (laughs) and a retaliator. (laughs) I always look at GVM as the instigator and me as the retaliator. And I'm not a fighter in hockey by any means, mm-hmm. but I'll be a fighter here. And so doing things like your podcast and having the Slay Society and writing my book and hosting weekly support groups for glioblastoma caregivers, mm-hmm. those are my way of retaliating and channeling all my anger into something that's actually going to be standing up against. Yeah. And productive. I love that you bring that up. And I thank you so much for actually saying that because it is, it was actually mine and Mike's motto uh, when he got diagnosed. And we were both athletes, we're both cyclists. Yeah. And so Game On became our motto. And that was why we named the podcast. It's why I named, see, I, I still use we. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, so, <laughs> um, it's why I named the podcast Game On Leo, because mm-hmm. this is in a positive way, in a strength way, in an empathetic way, we're taking this on. Yeah. And we're all doing it together and we're all doing it as a community and we're all in this together and it's inclusive. The name is inclusive yeah. for everybody. Yeah. And that is so vital and so important to me. So I appreciate that you say that, but it is, it's very much the truth. I mean, the work that you're doing mm-hmm. is in a, a positive way, taking this on. Absolutely. And fighting against and you're actually, you're doing it again. Yeah. And I'm going to bring this up very generally, <laughs> but another person within your orbit, somebody else that you are close to has now been diagnosed once again yeah. with glioblastoma. Yeah. So given the amount of impact that this has had on your life, how do you find the hope in each day? How do you find the strength and the light to stay positive? in such a difficult journey, especially as it's impacting your life for a third time <laughs> in a generalized way. And, and the work that you do with Slay Society, how, how do you move through that? For everybody listening, I mean, Shannon's being very respectful in saying this in a general way because we have not publicly and, and nor is much of my family ready to publicly discuss this. And so that's something I've had to <laughs> learn being such a public person. I've had to learn to reel that in and make it not about me. 
So I, so I appreciate that, Shannon. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, However, I did say that I was okay with her bringing this up this way. So yeah, we have been touched again for a third time by glioblastoma to some, you know, somebody incredibly close to our family. I mean, it's, oh gosh, I could answer this in so many ways, but one of them is that I just don't know that I've really fully accepted that this is happening. Mm we've kind of walked around for, you know, this this was several weeks ago now that we've known about this and we've sort of walked around for several weeks, just saying like, no, (laughs) like just no, it's can't, it can't be statistically possible for this to happen again. Mm -hmm. However, here we are. And then there's another side of me that I think I lost both my parents at the same time to the worst cancer out there. I had to do something with that. There was no way God or the universe or whoever Mm -hmm. gave me two parents at the same time. Their tumors were the same size, measured the same dimensions, the same location in their brain. There is just no way that that was handed to me, that hand to not do something with it. Mm -hmm. But I did the things. (laughs) I did it. I did well. So I sometimes I think, well, what am I missing? What are you trying to slap me in the face with that you would give a diagnosis like this to my family again? Like I did all the things I was, I wrote the book, I started the charity. I, I talk about this very publicly. Mm-hmm. I coach caregivers. I, you know, did I miss something? And somebody's trying to say like, Hey, come on, Laura, smart enough. Can, can I throw this out there real quick? Yeah. Maybe this isn't about a lesson that you need to learn. Yeah. Maybe this is for somebody else. Well, that's actually incredible. Incredible that that's your perception. And I don't disagree with you at all. And I actually hope if, I mean, we're, we're maybe being a little bit covert here, but I hope that if I'm on the same page as what you're saying, I hope that you're right. Mm-hmm. Now, part of me also is almost grateful. If there was going to be a diagnosis in, in my family and it was anything else, I wouldn't know what to do with it. <laughs> there are so many resources and you've got so much more knowledge yeah. now. Yeah. Then I mean that's how that's how I see it. I mean I didn't expect to become a pseudo expert <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> in brain cancer, yeah. but here we are, and there are so many there are so many things that we're on the cusp of mm-hmm. that we weren't even three and a half years ago. Absolutely, which really can be powerful and make a difference. There's this or somebody that I'm I'm close to that is going to be a guest on our third season as well. Mm -hmm. They recently posted a story on Instagram that really took me back. It just kind of hit me in the gut. It was very deep and it was an image and it was religiously based for them. And, you know, I'm a faithful person, but I always keep the dialogue very open because everybody's got different backgrounds and different cultures and different beliefs. Mm -hmm. But it was a surgeon and their team in a surgical room operating on a brain. And it was, you didn't see really the person on the table. You just saw them operating in the head. Right. Jesus with his hand on the surgeon's shoulder, hovering and looking over saying, why are you removing the tumor that I put in? Oh, wow. Right. Wow. Oh man, that, yeah. And that hit me square in the gut. And I actually said, that's deep. And when you're talking about this new circumstance Mm -hmm. that has arrived, within, you know, your, your circle, I'm thinking about that for some reason. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that with me. And I mean, with everybody, but specifically with me, because that just hit home a lot as well. (laughs) Like it did for you. You know, I thought you were going to say, you know, people pray for the surgeon's hands. And I thought maybe that was just another piece of that. And I did (laughs) not expect that. So I feel floored right now. Yeah. These are the circumstances. Mm -hmm that are part of life. Yeah. Life hits us. I mean, I have done the same thing that you have done with, you know, if you if if you knew you were going to take my husband, yeah. why didn't you let me have his baby? Why yeah. did we lose all of yeah. those kids? Why did we have all those miscarriages? Why did we lose? Why did you put us through that? If you knew he wasn't going to survive, if you knew a few months later, he'd be gone too. Why take so much right. from me? Yeah. So when you see uh, you know, just take a step back and to say that these things, they aren't just happening to us. Mm-hmm. And I think that sometimes the lesson isn't directly for us. It's powerful. Yeah. That image, that moment was extremely powerful. And I think that that is the journey Yeah, that we're on in this life. Yeah, that's just crazy. That's you know, give me a lot to take, take away from this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, trust me. It's yeah. And I, I will give 
credit to um, my friend who posted this. I mean, it was it was it's very powerful, and they are actually walking through glioblastoma themselves. Mm -hmm. So for them yeah. to post that and to have that perspective is so unbelievably powerful, and it's a strong. That is a really strong statement, and it's it's one of, it's a wow moment. It's where you just take a step back and you're like, whoa, okay, yeah, yeah, it definitely <laughs> is. Because here we fight so hard to do, you know, to to stop. Yep all these things from happening, but why are they happening in the first place? Yeah. Yeah. As we get ready to wrap up with everything that is going on in your orbit and the amount of work that you do, because the Slay Society is still running. It's still up and active. Yeah. You guys are doing a ton of work up in Canada. Mm -hmm. With all that you are doing in the community, how do you stay balanced? How do you continue to heal? What do you do for yourself to continue to heal? Because we're always healing. Once something like this happens, you're always healing. You're always growing. You're always trying to find a way to move forward. So how do you do that while navigating this continued community and the lessons that you're continuing to learn and all of the work that you're doing uh, in the brain cancer community? I have so many answers and, you know, because <laughs> I have so many answers, but then what just popped into my head and I almost started giggling is that I actually just take a lot more baths than I ever used to. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I love that. When my parents got sick, it became, I wanted to feel enveloped in warmth and I just, I gravitated towards the bath, like three, four, five, six nights a week. I'd be in, <laughs> can't find me. I'm in the bath. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, quite honestly, learning how to practice, I write in my book, the self-care myth, like there's a whole chapter I call the self-care myth. I hate the concept. I hate the, the sort of trendy topic of self-care, but mm -hmm. I also recognize that you do have to stop and do these things for yourself once in a while. And so that did become part of the lesson I learned was how to just really slow down. Mm. I'm not good at it at all. And, uh, but I'm learning how to slow down and take that time for myself, whether it's a bath or losing myself in a fiction book, even hockey. I mean, th those things are still just a huge outlet for me mm -hmm. and for my, my mental health. And then the Slay Society, like really pouring myself back into really purposeful, meaningful work mm -hmm. is so healing. And I don't know, it, it helps, you know, I do, I do work for a platform called Rune, which you know of, and yes. they're an online glioblastoma resource, just an incredible resource. And that's been purposeful and meaningful. And to then, you know, pair that with the Slay Society is so purposeful and meaningful. Mm -hmm. And I think the fact that I've been able to pivot my life into this, a direction I certainly never wanted or could foresee, but a direction that, and this might make sense to you with the podcast after losing Mike, it makes sense of a nonsensical situation. Yeah. This is my way of making sense of losing both my parents at the same time in a pandemic, you know, mm -hmm. that helps me balance. It, it also helps that I do have, and I'm so fortunate to have just an incredibly supportive husband who does show up. I was just, can we, what is his name? His first name? His name's Kenny. Kenny. Yeah. Because I was just about to throw some credit his way. Yeah, um, we have to. You have an amazing husband and you have amazing children Yeah, and you have such a blessed and beautiful and long marriage. Yeah, We have to tip our hat to Kenny because he is your pillar. He really is. And I'm glad we're taking a second to shout out to him because you know, even in these last four days, I was at this four day long event and it was 12 hour days and, and he's managing, dropping off the kids at school, getting all their lunches ready, doing his own work day, picking them up, getting them to all. I mean, I'm, I'm a hockey player. He's a hockey player. Don't think our kids are not all incredibly busy. athletes. As well. <laughs> so we typically have between 10 and 12 sports appointments, I guess, uh, or events a week, a week. And so, and we, and we love that. We thrive in that. That's how we grew up. That's, mm -hmm. you know, that's the, the culture of our family. But he was managing all of that on his own. And I'd be coming home at 10 o'clock at night, exhausted from doing these 12 hour events. And, and he's just amazing. He's amazing. You know, he's got a lot on his own plate. He is a good man. Yeah, he really, really is. And I'm very fortunate. And for him to say, you know, for that first year, sure, Laura, don't work. And let me be honest, I stretched that year into two. I mean, I was working for Slay, doing Slay Society, but I don't pay myself at this point through the Slay Society. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's still all volunteer. And so while I'm pouring myself into this purposeful work, he's looking at our bank account, <laughs> thinking, 
well, this is, this is a little stressful for me. Yeah. Um, but no, he's just beautiful, kind, supportive human. And I'm very, very lucky to have him in my corner. So as we wrap up, I'm going to give you some time to let everybody know where they can find you. Before we do that, say one thing about your mom and one thing about your dad, about their personality, who they were before GBM. One thing that is just, it epitomizes just who each of them, each of them are. Hmm. I know that's hard to narrow down if we had two hours. <laughs> it's so hard, but you know, I, this is what comes to me is my mom taught me. She'd always say this, whether I was a teenager making bad choices or a little girl trying to, you know, pocketing a candy at the store and walking out with it. And, she, and I'm not a thief, but I'm just whatever growth in my life was needing to happen at that time. My mom would never really have a lot of words to say to me. But she would always just look at me with this very strong mom look that I try to perfect, but I don't think I've got it down. <laughs> and she would say, just do the right thing, kid. Mm -hmm. And it was like this backhanded guilt <laughs> of like, do the right thing. Oh, moms are good at that. It's so good. So good. <laughs> and, you know, like I'm watching, your dad's watching, God's watching, whoever. But that always just stays with me. And, you know, even if it was, I don't know, I don't know, it doesn't even matter. But any example at any time in my life, at any age, at any transitional stage, I can always go back to her looking at me no matter what I asked her and just saying, do the right thing, kid. Mm. That was sort of what she was all about. She was just honest and good and kind and compassionate and faithful and beautiful. She was just beautiful, bright, bright light. And anyone who knew her is better for knowing her. My dad was just very humble and so funny. He was so funny. He was growing up. He was the dad that everybody wanted to have <laughs> all the way through his um, treatment, his diagnosis, his treatment. He just remained, oh God, he was stubborn, but he remained hopeful and he never for a second lost his sense of humor. Mm. Never. He never stopped making jokes, even really bad ones. He was known for his dad jokes and he was so stubborn that when the doctor said, you know, you might have 12 to 18 months and that's an average. He said, screw that. I'm going to take 10 years. Now he did not get, obviously he passed away after seven months, but he went through that seven months adamantly saying he was going to have 10 years. And I don't know that it really crossed his mind much that he might not. And I think that's kind of a beautiful thing mm -hmm. that he went through with just tons and tons of hope through that whole journey. So your parents are very, very special people. And I'm glad that we've been able to highlight and touch on not only their story and their character, but your journey with them. For anybody who wants to learn more, where can people look you up, find out more about the Slay Society? Um, we do have, you know, we are online on our website, which is www.slaysocietyinc.ca. We are much more active on social media, both on Facebook and Instagram and actually TikTok as well. So you can find, just search Slay Society Inc. on any of those platforms and you'll find us there. And then anyone can all also follow me personally at Laura Dill, um, Laura Dill 12 on Instagram and just Laura Dill on Facebook, because I do just share a lot of my own inside personal journey, grief, resources, stuff like that through my personal pages too. Well, Laura, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been such a powerful conversation and I'm so glad that we were able to bring this to our community. Again, for everybody who's listening, we will have all of the information up on our website, resources, hyperlinks on Slay Society and where you can learn more. And with that, we will be right back. This episode is brought to you by UB Neurosurgery. Learn more at ubns.com. Welcome to another Grace Walk. Have you ever asked the question, what's the key to a life that matters? Especially when walking through grief or trauma in whatever form it takes, how do you make your life matter after going through significant grief, trauma, loss? The answer is not simple, but it is purposeful. Live each day with intentionality. When you live each day with intentionality, there's almost no limit to what you can do. You can transform yourself, your family, 
your community, your nation. When you intentionally use everyday life to bring about positive change in the lives of others, you begin to live a life that matters. Positive change is the key. There are many negative people in the world. There are many people that bully, that manipulate, that lie, that deceive to make their life matter. But if you walk each day with intentionality and create positive change within the story that you're living, you will start to see the dominoes fall in so many wonderful and magical ways. T.S. Eliot once said, if you aren't in over your head, how do you know how tall you are? Live each day with purpose, with intentionality, with grace. Even if you're in over your head, walk tall and keep walking forward. Let grace be your transportation. Walk with grace, with guidance, with gratitude. This segment of The Grace Walk is from our new social media channel, The Grace Walks. You can follow along at The Grace Walks, follow us along on TikTok at Game on Glio Podcast, or on Twitter. These segments will be regularly featured at the end of every Game on Glio episode for the rest of the season. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time. You've been listening to the Game on Glio Podcast the podcast that is designed to educate, advocate, and tell the real stories of those walking the journey of brain cancers, such as glioblastoma and grief and loss. Like what you hear? Share us with others. Follow us on Instagram at Game on Glio Podcast, Facebook at Game on Glio, or visit our website or YouTube channel. You can find us anywhere podcasts are played.